because we don't understand how life formed. It is difficult to estimate this probability. The likelihood of a complex molecule like DNA being created by random collisions of atoms in a primordial ocean is fantastically small. In an infinite universe, it would happen in some places, but they would be very far apart. If we want to find advanced intelligent life, our best bet is to listen for radio signals. Look up to the stars and the forest that surround. Do you see them? Do you hear them? Are they there? SpacedOutRadio.com presents S4 with Forest Moon Paranormal's Eric Cooper and friends. Also, take the time to join the Forest Moon Paranormal Facebook group. I knew I should have made a left turn in Albuquerque. Space travelers, it's time to go live on S4 with Eric Cooper. Welcome Everything to S- is awesome. All right. Welcome to S4, folks. Uh, we're up here in the mountains of concrete, Washington, and Seth is over in New York City, I think. Right, New York City? <laughs> nope. Right in the middle of New York State. Okay. There you go. I knew it was New York. Count, I, count I, I knew it was New York. Yep. So... The opinions and uh, thoughts here in S4 do not reflect that of Spaced Out Radio. If you haven't heard of Spaced Out Radio, then, oh, my God, you're missing out. Every night from 9 to midnight Pacific Standard Time at www.spacedoutradio.com. Don't miss it. Um, We are an affiliate show. And, you know, like like I was telling you, I got called a dictator because... I'm very strict. Oh, dude, dude, I'm I'm very strict about what comes across Forest Moon Paranormal. And uh, when it comes down to it, if it's not a Spaced Out Radio affiliated show, it does not go in the group. And uh, mm-hmm. some, some people can't get that. Now, for our listeners, um, we do have internet issues up here in the mountains. We will be getting that fixed within the next month or two. So if this show, I'm watching my, uh, my, my studio... Uh, button here and if we break more than twice then what we're gonna do because for whatever reason skype likes my internet but spreaker does not 
So, if for whatever reason um, we start getting cut out and whatnot, then we are going to continue the show as a recording and then post it after the show is done so you all won't miss any information. It'll just suck not having a live broadcast and having y'all in the chat room. It'll be awesome. It's always awesome. And it's always awesome having Pointy Stick Joe in the group. I, 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 I love it. I love uh, I love our audience. You guys are all awesome. Um, our, our Aussie crew, they're all awesome. And matter of fact, the Aussie crew is going to love the show. I've got my list here, but they're going to love our show in, I believe, mm-hmm. April. We're going to talk Pine Gap versus I don't have it. Damn it. Anyway, we're going to be talking Pine Gap versus Area 51 versus Dugway Proving Grounds and what's going on there? <laughs> um, and it's all going to be based on... Yeah, that's going to be awesome. Well, I'm hoping we have some of our Aussie friends that are actually going to do some research on Pine Gap because Pine Gap Australia is... United States government owned in Australia. And it's hmm. also a very, uh, it's a hot spot for UFOs, just like Area 51 he- is here. So, you know, what are they doing? And, you, you know, you got the 1971 case, uh, Vallea, I believe it was, of, of his airplane, his Cessna, that disappeared out of nowhere, happened in Australia. And they couldn't find any wreckage, no oil, you know, oil slicks, no nothing. Um, so, you know, you look at those kind of cases and you go, well, you got Pine Gap right there. Um, hmm. Mm-hmm. Things that make you go, hmm. So, April 1st, and, I, and Corey, my right-hand man, is here. Uh, always happy to see Corey in the, in the room. Uh, we got some plans for Corey. <laughs> he, doesn't, he just doesn't know yet. <laughs> um, <laughs> so... April 1st, we're having our big meet and greet, which is probably just going to be Forest Moon Paranormal, the three or four of us, and locally, that is. Hopefully, it's going to grow, because we're looking for new members to join the team that can either be, and we're going to get to that in a minute, um, that can either be researchers, I don't even give a damn if you're in Washington, researchers, researchers could be anywhere. Uh, but we're looking for techies, we're looking for psychiatrists, psychologists, scientists, um, you you name it. We want to broaden the spectrum here. And so April 1st, 6 p.m. at the Denny's and Mount Vernon Banquet Room, we will have a meet and greet. And I know Spirit Roper is going to be there, we're going to be there, and uh, Bumps Paranormal, I believe, is going to be there. Bumps, I'm excited to meet. They actually cover Bigfoot, UFO, alien, and hauntings like we do. That's rare. Most of these groups, uh, uh, the paranormal, it's only hauntings and ghosts. No, it's not. It's the whole spectrum. Explain that to an alien abductee that their crisis situation doesn't matter because, well, they just don't fall under the paranormal umbrella. Um, Yeah, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Um, Tripping. Shoot me a Facebook message uh, with your email so I can get you an application. I can't remember if I sent you an application a few months ago or not, or last year. Um, and we'll get you we'll, we'll get you fit in there. Here's here's the scoop though. So I've got three different psychiatrists, and what I'm going to do with them is basically giving giving me a screening process that I can look at a client and look at this questionnaire that they make. Um, kind of giving me an idea of what to look for with psychiatric conditions. Um, I've got Markham working on the science aspect. He's going to make a protocol and a kind of investigative format on radiation levels for UFO sightings, um, things of that nature. Um, so we can actually broaden this out to an actual scientific field to an actual psychiatric field. Um, I've also got a psychiatrist that's in Mississippi that is there. She's there for our disposal. If we find an abductee that uh, wants to go talk to and get an abduction peer-led support group going, then she's there to facilitate it. 
And, and that's what we need. We need peer-led therapy. So our abductees don't feel, you know, by themselves and left out there. Um, and that's the game plan. And I'm going horse already. It's, it's early in the show and I'm already going horse. What the hell? Hold on a sec here. Yeah, a sec here. you know, I'm, I'm kind of battling the same thing <laughs> a little bit. We've had a whole bunch of, we've had a whole bunch of stuff going around up here. But I got to right. tell you guys, um, especially those who aren't familiar with S4 and the spaced out radio and the format and the way things go, I've had experiences uh, ever since I was little. Uh, I mean, I remember being at the school bus stop and swearing that there was a gray in the tree behind me watching me. Uh, and I know I'm not crazy. And I have to say one thing. It's just that, you know, guys, you know, the listeners of Spaced Out Radio, S4, the affiliates, the whole group that we hang with. We're, you know, we're a smarter breed. I, I'm not trying, I'm not trying to be a jerk when I say it, but we are, I mean, the listeners, the hosts, we're, you know, we know how to cook our pizza pockets without getting burnt in the roof of the mouth. Uh, and our tinfoil hats actually fit. Um, if you listen to us, you listen to affiliates, things like that, you're not going to be disappointed. And we welcome you if if there's something that we say maybe you don't agree with or maybe you question it. By all means, I mean, you know, for a minute off topic, Dave had, you know, several topics when he talks about his thought of the Dave. And he's talking about paranormal trust is one issue, uh, trust in the paranormal community. And I have to say, for one, that would mean to me that if I caught what I felt was any type of evidence uh, and Coop says, hey, can I see that? Uh, can I listen to those EVPs? Uh, I'm going to share them and I'm going to share them freely. I'm not going to say, you know, they're mine. I mean, they're mine in the sense that maybe I recorded them or documented them, whatever. But if you're a good investigator of any sort, you're going to want to openly share that so that other people can give their opinion. You have other paranormal investigators who've been around longer, you know, like Coop and Forest Moon Paranormal and stuff like that. And you're going to want their input. And it's not a matter necessarily of right and wrong. It's a matter of trying to figure these things out together. But if you've ever hung around in a spaced out radio program, whether or not it's on the weekend, during the week, and you go into the chat, Dave may be behind the microphone, or Liz, or Skeeter, or James, you know. But as a listener, when you're in that chat, it's almost like you're behind the microphone because your questions almost always get answered. I mean, any time I pop in, I know that Dave's going to pluck one of my questions. He's going to say, well, we have a question from Seth regarding, uh, you know, Bigfoot knocking on on trees. I mean, does he knock in a pattern or does he just knock sporadically? <laughs> what happens with that? Sporadically. Uh, I mean, does he play, d does he, does he play taps? Uh, <laughs> and I, I got to say real quick, but, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see mm -hmm. Markham. Markham is in the chat room. That's awesome. Markham is going to design awesome. our. He's going to design our scientific format, and we are actually going to. Let me throw in real quick. April eighth is going to be a fun training day, and for the locals that are listening, April eighth training will be. It'll be starting at noon, and we're going to have a barbecue, and we're actually going to go through the entire gamut of what goes on in an investigation. Uh, because it's going to be at Northern State Dairy, which is a known hotspot. Um, it's not an investigation because I don't believe in investigating a hotspot. That's for training. Um, you got all these groups. Mm -hmm. We're going to go investigate Waverly Hills, really what's been done a thousand times. So why are you going to investigate it? It's great for training. It's great for tra taking the newbie, the new person that has never experienced the paranormal but wants to. 
And you take them out because you know they're going to get an apparition picture. You know they're going to get the EVP. And they're going to be excited. Um, so what we're going to do, I'm going to have two or three different scenarios. One scenario is going to be your normal haunting. One might be, uh, I don't know, I'm not going to spoil it. <laughs> one might be a UFO. One might be a Bigfoot, because I can do all three of them in, in one area. Obviously, uh, I don't care about an EVP with Bigfoot. I don't care about an EVP with a UFO, per se. But we're going to sit there. I'm going to receive a, a, a fake phone call. And we're going to start from the very beginning of what's going to happen with case management. Then we're going to simulate going to the site and what's going to happen when we get to the site. Um, all the way down. And then we're going to do an AAR, an after action review, and take questions, that kind of thing. We're going to use that time to test their protective measures, the whole nine yards. So it's going to be a fun training. In May is our wilderness survival. Always going to be the second Saturday of the month. And I'm going to bring it up again real quick. People ask, why do you do wilderness survival in a paranormal team? Why do we do a wilderness survival in a paranormal team, Seth? I'll tell you why. Because if you're going investigating, chances are some of these places that you're going to be investigating may not have a sound or 100% safe environment. And it's like you said before, we discussed it that, uh, you know, like you'll see these guys on TV, they'll go out in the woods and they'll be totally unprepared for a situation. <laughs> and then, I mean, I mean, most adults, and I, I'm not trying to say this in an insulting way, shape or form, but there's the disclaimer just in case it is. Um, but most adults have the sense when you're going out into the woods that you should probably take first aid with you, communication. I know mm -hmm. I'm not going deep into the woods without my ham radio, first aid kit, my cell phone. Uh, my ham radio is going to trump that cell phone to begin with, but that's right. beside the point. But you see these guys on TV, and they say, well, our cameraman, it's okay. Where's the guy who knows what to do if uh, something jumps up out of these trees and bites my damn finger off? Uh, wear somebody in case I see something that I can't quite explain, and that sends me into cardiac arrest. Uh, I mean, for for one, for me, myself, with my low vision, I have glaucoma, so I'm not going alone to begin with. And that's the number one thing I say, but you got to be safe and use common sense. And during any type of investigation like that, uh, Murphy's law has to take effect. Whatever can happen, you know, necessarily will happen. You may not catch that EVP, but what if you catch a tree branch to the throat? What if you, uh, you know, something as small as breaking a bone? You're going to want to have someone out there because it's like Les Stroud, his survivalist. Like he said, whenever you are in the wilderness, which is which is sad to say that being in the wilderness as a human being is no longer part of our element. It's actually out of our element. And that's very sad, but um, whenever unless, you have an injury. Unless uh, you yeah, live in concrete. It, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I grew up in the mountains and stuff like that, so I'm familiar. But any any injury... When you are away from a place where you can get immediate help, any injury is magnified by a hundredfold very easily. And it doesn't take, you know, it, it doesn't take but a few minutes, sometimes a few seconds, depending, to get from bad to worse. And either yourself or your buddy, you are going to want them to know their first aid. It's like when I talked with my wife about the first day we, we made a survival uh, a long time ago. I wrote about look around you and find your zombie apocalypse team. That's and my right. wife is a nurse. I, 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 I said, you know what? In times like, you know, in The Walking Dead, they had a character who he was a veterinarian and he ended up being like the surgeon for everybody. So I'm thinking, you know, my wife's a nurse and if uh, if crap hits the fan then she's upgraded to Surgeon General in this household, you know. I mean, that's just that's just how it is. So exactly. when you go on these investigations, the first, the first aid is a must. Having someone for communication is a must. 
Well, uh, it, it, I know it, we're going to get into a survival program later down the road, so. Right, and it's the same setup with any special forces or ranger team. A ranger team is usually a five-man team. Mm-hmm. You got you got your weapon specialist. Well, we don't really need a weapon specialist per se for the paranormal. Well, pointy sticks. Joe is our weapon specialist. He, he's got he's got the pointy sticks covered. Um, you got your medic. You've got your uh, your your comms guy. Your commo. You've got uh, your scout. I mean, you you've got every every ranger's SF mm-hmm. team, which is what the QRT is based off of, is. Completely set up. Um, they're self-contained, and so, and they're all trained in wilderness survival. And and you hit the nail on the head. You, you've got the Bigfoot show. The guy's in khakis and he's got nothing, maybe a bottle of water, you know. And so all these Joe schmoes, um, no pun intended, Joe. <laughs> but you, you know, you got all these. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you've got all these city folk. And, and and again, no disrespect intended, but ain't never been, mm-hmm. ain't, ain't never set foot in the woods, and they're watching this Bigfoot, you know, mountain monsters, whatever, and ain't none of them experienced anything in the wilderness, and they go, oh wow, we got to go mm-hmm. up and look for Bigfoot. Well, never mind that, you know, mm-hmm. they might be up in the woods, but you know, this guy on TV, he's got. A camera crew, and I guarantee the camera crew's got you know probably a doctor or a a, a first aid kit or whatever, and probably a wilderness survival kit. Um, so anything happens mm-hmm. to them, they just stop the camera and, and do what they got to do. But now you now you got these inexperienced people that are going to run up into the mountains looking for Bigfoot, and if something happens to them, I'm sorry, but search and rescue got to go find them. And there you go. So that's why we have wilderness survival as part of our training. Um, now in June, I, and I've kind of cut out the stand-up ceremony and all that because you know what, we're always going to be training, and I'm not going to stop training just because we get all the all the training I want done finished. So we're not going to do a stand-up ceremony because we're just going to keep on training. And in June, we're going to cover the science aspect because I'm hoping Markham's got the uh, scientific protocol done, the evidence collection techniques done, and all that stuff. And we'll be training on that. We're going to do a lot of extensive training on alien races and UFO investigation. And I've got Tyler Allen Standing Bear is going to come in and do the Bigfoot encrypted investigative training. He's teaching that. So, overall, our team is going to be trained in all aspects of the paranormal from beginning to end. So, that's that. Let's talk the Council of Five. So, we covered... Oh, yeah. We covered the Immerther a whole lot last show. I, I, I keep wanting to say last week, yeah. but... But mm-hmm. I, I yeah. had I had eighteen students or eight, eighteen people in the class last week. It was a good good class, and I actually it was kind of exciting in that I had people in that class who were just as excited about hearing about aliens and UFOs as they were hauntings and spirits. So I thought that was really cool because usually they hear paranormal one hundred one. A lot of them just come thinking, "Oh wow, I'm going to hear about spirits and ghosts." And, well, they got a lot more to the spirits and ghosts, and their questions actually covered alien, UFO, and Bigfoot as well. So, I was happy with that. Um, but, anyway, so we, if you want to hear about the Immerther, we're not going to really hit the Immerther tonight, because we already covered them. Now, I got the Sorry, alien... Man, the Immerther was the prettiest girl at the <laughs> <laughs> Right? <laughs> Um, I got the Alien Races mm-hmm. book printed out, and uh, I was going back through it tonight, and I found it odd. I'm going to find that page real quick, because there was a comment by one of the races that the Council of Five will be the Council of None. 
Um, that, that tells me that the Council of Five is under a uh, heavy threat. Hmm, that's interesting. You're going to have to tell me about that one, because as far as far as I understood, the Immerther were kind of keeping people at bay, or not people, but keeping the others at bay, but that must have been just within the confines of the council. So now I'm wondering who's threatening them. Oh, God, dude. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a lot of threats. You've got the mat- Matra. Um, and, and, yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, Corey. I think it's, uh, I think they call it Matra, mat- Matra. Uh, even even Markham Markham's got the book too, um, and I mean just just reptilians and the Greys alone are enough of a threat. So there's a lot of threats out there. That I, I, you know, if you look through the book, you've got more malevolent species or races out there than you do benevolent. Uh, there's probably about ten benevolent. Uh, the rest of them are either either a threat or indifferent. To the human race. Matra. There you go. Mater. The Mater race. The Mater race actually has a huge following. If you want to call them a following. Um, but <laughs> and for those that missed the show a couple months ago, go look for the alien 100 alien races. And I cover most of them. Uh, we did a three show series on the alien races. The book I'm looking for is Eisenhower had, and uh, Dave Scott actually has me looking for that, because uh, Eisenhower actually has, had a book of 185 races um, from the United States. Nobody knows where they are, or where that book is, um, but Eisenhower is very strict about his information, right down to Task Force Silk. I still haven't, I haven't really looked, but I still haven't found. Task Force Silk is actually also mentioned in the Alien Race book. Mm-hmm. Um, I've done my research on that one, but trying to find them, man, it's like trying to hit Coke into a bottle with a ball bat. Um, <clears throat> what I'm doing is I'm trying to locate grandkids, Eisenhower's grandkids, because you know if there's something, word word has to go around. It has to. has to go around somehow. I mean, it, he's on his deathbed, stuff like that. He says something, goes down the line, down the line, down. I mean, if I'm the president and I saw something and I know I'm going to croak, be like, hey, everybody, come here. <laughs> you ain't going to believe this. Well, um, and you know, it's, it's but, probably yeah. it's probably in a it's probably in a box up in a great grandkid's attic. That nobody thinks about looking in. Attics. <laughs> That's probably where it is. Because that ain't a book you're going to put in the Pentagon. Maybe it is. But I think it's in an attic somewhere. So, yeah. Finding one of the grandkids or relatives might be the only way. I also have Gil from Blue Planet Project uh, looking through his sources. Um, but again, she, and he's heard of the book as well. And it's funny. I'm looking at the notes page of this book. Mm-hmm. And 2017 is mentioned so many times. More planes are being ready for 2017. Why? Makes you wonder why. Really? We've got, we've got more and more lights in the sky. We've had more lights in the sky up here in the mountains in the last two weeks that I can recall since we lived here for five years. And uh, There's all kinds of freaky stuff happening in the sky here, man. Yeah. Oh, 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 shit. I got a message this morning from a woman in the UK. Mm -hmm. She sent me a video that was recorded six hours. So that would have been early morning for us of trumpets. Mm -hmm. You know, the, all these videos that have been coming up for the last year or two 
in all, you know, in the whole vast of the globe, in different countries, of this mysterious trumpet sound. Difference in this one, though, and this is over London, there were trumpets and there was a UFO. I was talking to mm. Dave on the phone. I, I was talking to Dave on the phone today that, you know what, that kind of puts them together. Because in the other videos I've seen, there hasn't been anything in the sky, just a trumpeting sound. But in this particular case, there's a trumpeting sound and lights in the sky. And so, you know what? Yeah, uh, four days ago, alien noise makes terrifying return after a loud hum uh, from the Daily Star. There's, I, I mean, I just typed in, if you guys go to Google and you type in trumpets heard around the world exactly like that, I yep. mean, you're going to see exactly what we're talking about. And these sightings, if you, if you even click, this, like where it gives you the options, you just click news. Uh, let's see, there's one article, 17 hour, article, 14 hours, 18 hours, another one, two hours ago. <laughs> Uh, I mean, these reports are coming in. Any kind of, of uh, on other programs, I'm not going to name drop anybody, but there's been people reporting these sounds and sonic booms that aren't really making it <coughs> to mainstream news. Uh, a couple years ago, I know the fireballs in the sky was a big thing, and that actually made the mainstream news here. There were fireballs right over the town that I live in, and that was reported um, and that was in the middle of the night. I had no way of knowing it because I didn't have internet at work at the time. And I come home in the morning and I see them. But it makes me wonder, uh, religious by fault, I believe we have a creator or creators. I don't know who or what that's in question for me. Uh, but there's a lot, a lot of old world religions talking about all these phenomenon in one different way, shape or form. And there's so many of them, if you put a Venn diagram together, Coop, that I think, and I'm not a fear monger by any means, but I study, I look around, I do my homework, and listeners, this stuff doesn't happen for nothing. <laughs> nope. It's, it's not just going on for the sake of going on. There is definitely a rise in this. And I think that it has to do with these races that are vigilant over us and at war because of us. And that's why we're talking about this tonight. Oh, and, and since we're talking 2017, so here's here's what I'm reading to you folks right now is notes from alien races that are in this. And here we go. You still there, Seth? So the studio is disconnected. What's that? The studio is disconnected. We're not live right now. Um, uh, yeah. All right, still there, Seth? 